lunch break. Welcome back to the first elder session of the afternoon. I hope we had a nice lunch. Um, this session will have very, very uh, three very interesting talks. The first talk will be by Hamish Carr on distributed hierarchical contour trees. Thank you, Marcus. As you can probably tell by looking at the slide, we're trying to pack as many terms into it as possible. Uh, more precisely, what we're working on here is how to distribute the contra tree, and to do that, we have to do it hierarchically. Um, and this is joint work between myself at the University of Leeds and Oliver Rubel and Gunter Weber at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and I tried to fit all the logos in along the bottom edge. Now, the context of this is that, as some of you know, I've been working on problems involving the contra tree for many years. The attraction of the contra tree is that it gives us a form of analysis, which more and more is crucial to inform our visualizations. So to a large extent, I'm the large scale data analysis component, less than the visualization today, even though I also work on that part of it. Secondly, we're making the practical assumption that we're dealing with an input data, which is a scalar field. In this case, represented by one of our small test sets, which is an eight by nine data set, and you'll notice I've put the data values on it. I'm not going to expect you to understand or even read them. They're just there for reference. Now, the trick to this is, what the contour tree does is it analyzes the contours you could draw on this and identifies which ones of them are, sorry, which ones of them are equivalent to others. It uses that as a means of computing features of importance. And the net result is that we divide the original data set into a set of topological zones, which we are then going to simplify at a later date, and which we are going to use as the basis for computation. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to shrink wrap the contours in the data set down to a skeletal structure which tells us what's going on. And on this occasion, you can see I've color coded which topological zone corresponds to which branch of the tree. And all of this stuff we've done for a while. The standard serial algorithm for this was something that I worked on during my master's degree and which saw the light of day uh, at Soda in 2000 and then uh, in a journal in 2003. Now, the problem with that is, as you all know, as you go to scale, serial algorithms suck. So the question is, how can we parallelize this? And the problem is, much of the mathematics behind it is serial in nature. Um, at present, the best shared memory parallel algorithm that I'm aware of is probably the one that um, we presented at LDAV here in 2016. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I don't actually care which shared memory algorithm you use or whether you use a serial algorithm on node. I'm just going to assume that we take advantage of whatever acceleration is possible on node because I'm interested in the distributed layer today. Now, the distributed layer there is an algorithm published back in 2004 by Valerio Pascucci and Cree Cole McLaughlin. Um, it has a minor problem, which we'll get to um, on the next slide, and which is the real motivation for this talk. There is also a distributed algorithm for computing the merge tree, which is a related computation back in 2014 at supercomputing, and we will exploit that too but it's not actually computing the contra tree, and it is non-trivial to extend it to this. So if we look at uh, Valerio's algorithm from back in 2004, what you do is you break your data up into blocks. And so this is a classic fan-in type of distributed algorithm. So in the four corners, you can see the contra trees for the individual blocks. If we look at the one in the top left corner, for example, you can see that there are some light blue vertices and some purple vertices. Notice that the two different zones are not distinct on this block for the very simple reason that the topology that makes them interesting occurs on another block. So as far as this block is concerned, and I'm just going to wait, yeah. As far as this block is concerned, the bl light blue and purple 
form part of the same feature. And it's not until we disambiguate that that we actually get the correct answer. So we are looking at property that is shared between blocks, and we're going to have to build it up from the information on the individual blocks. So what Valerio and Cree did was they said, if we take the contra tree for that block and the contra tree from the block in the lower left, and we glue those contra trees together, and you'll see that in the middle, then that's equivalent to gluing the two blocks together. We now have a graph, which I call a topology graph. And because the contra tree algorithms are fundamentally graph algorithms, all you have to do is run the contra tree algorithm on that graph, and you get the correct graph for the combined blocks. Repeat that on the right-hand side, you get a different contra tree for that pair of blocks. Combine the two together, and we're now talking uh, in the lower center. We get a topology graph, which sums those two graphs, those two trees. We recompute the contra tree, and we get the correct contra tree for the entire data set. And you might think that that was job done. The problem with this is, however, that that means that the entire contra tree ends up resident on the final node. And as the contra tree gets bigger, and as the data sizes get bigger, and the data gets noisier, we do not have enough memory on one node to store it. So the problem that we're really trying to address is how do we distribute not so much this, the computation itself in terms of speed, but how do we do it in such a way that the contra tree is inherently distributed as a data structure? And that's the true target of this. Any speed gains are incidental. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to that top left block, and we're going to look at the contra tree for that block. And we observe that the red zone is entirely interior to the block. And that means that no other block really needs to know about it, even though it has the global maximum. Aha. So what we're going to try and do is strip these parts out. And to do so, we analyze the contra tree on this block and divide it into two pieces. We divide it into the boundary tree and the interior forest. Now, the condition for this is, quite clearly, any contour that crosses the boundary to another block, we're going to have to defer some of the computation. So what we do is we take all of the vertices on the boundary, and we flag them as significant, and then we take the graph closure of them inside the contour tree to get the portion of the contour tree that needs to be transferred inwards. And we refer to this as the boundary tree. Everything else is a bunch of branches connected to it. That means there are a bunch of subtrees. So we call that the interior forest. And the invariant we exploit is that those are already correctly computed. So we can keep them locally and come back to them later. So what we're going to do as a strategy is we're going to strip out interior forest at each stage compute the contra tree of what's left, strip out interior forest, keep going, and then we, when we get into the middle, we reverse back out, gluing the portions, the interior forests that are um, locally important, back in at each level. And so it works like this. There's my first block, and there's my contra tree, uh, broken into interior forest in color, to make it a bit more obvious, and boundary tree in black and white. So the black and white is what we haven't determined yet. The color are the bits that we're now certain of. Similarly, in the lower left corner, notice that on this occasion, there are no interior zones because it's quite a small data set. So the entire tree is going to get sent in. But if you look very carefully at the highest node in there, you'll notice I've actually put a double ring on it. And that's because it's actually in the, in, the, in the interior of the block. It's technically not needed. Because all we care about is once the contours hit the boundary of the block. So if we want to be picky, we can strip it out. Or if we want to be lazy, we can leave it in. And I'll come back to that um, in a slide or two. So we then combine the two contra trees to get a topology graph. And you'll notice that we've got the edges from both of them. 
and then we compute the contra tree from the pair. And at this point, we can identify the yellow zone as being in the interior of the combined block. We can therefore remove it for later processing and retain what's left. We do the same thing over here. We identify the blue and brown regions as belonging to interior forests at the lowest level. We glue them together to get a topology graph. And on this occasion, there are no additional um, regions to remove for the interior forest. We get a new contra tree. And we combine them one more time. And notice that at this point, what we've really done is we've removed those colored regions from the computation. Now, the interesting thing is that when you're learning about the contra tree, one of the things we will tell you is that the analysis is based on what's called the Reeb graph. And if you compute the Reeb graph for a simple domain, you are guaranteed that the output is a tree. The converse is not true, and you can see an example of it here. So the net result is that as the computation progresses, we knock larger and larger regions out of the computation, and our domain starts looking in 2D like a piece of lace, and in 3D it starts looking like Swiss cheese. But that's fine, because we've got an invariant which tells us that at all stages we have the correct tree. So the correct tree for this one is just a single vertical super arc. For clarity, however, and it's hard to see on this illustration, I've broken it into four chunks according to the color of the zones that it represents. But as far as it's concerned, it's just one big zone because that's all it knows. Now, at the next stage, we fan back out. We take that single-edged tree, and we take the interior forest that we kept on the left. So notice I've now grayed out the boundary forest, and I glue it back in. I do the same thing on the right, and I glue back in nothing. Happens. I then do the same thing in the top left and glue back in the red branch. In the bottom left, I glue back in nothing. And on the right, I glue back in the blue and brown edges, respectively. So what I now have is I have a representation where all of the topology that any given block needs to know about is computed correctly for that block and stored on that block, but where each block has a different contra tree. So you can see that the information is now truly distributed, and because it's done one level of a time, you can see why we're calling it distributed hierarchical contra tree. Now, final stage, notice that when I take those distributed hierarchical contra trees and glue them together, lo and behold, I get the correct global contra tree. Okay? And that's the heart of it. The rest of it is the heavy lifting to make it happen. Because as you can imagine, doing this with um, shared memory processing on each node and arranging for the MP MPI exchange can be quite tricky. So what we do is we chose to use PPP, which is our uh, previous work on shared memory parallelism locally, but you could use any contra tree algorithm locally. We're going to use the hyperstructure, which my student um, uh, Peter Christoph uh, showed at LDAV a year or two ago, for storing it because that gives us efficient parallel access to the structure. Now, the problem is that that hyperstructure um, we actually constructed in a set of layers themselves. So we now have two layers of layers. But all we're going to do is we're going to have layers representing the tree according to each node, and then we're going to graft additional um, branches into them. Now to do that, especially since we don't have to carry too much information forwards, the only thing we can rely on is making sure that every vertex in the mesh has a global ID and that means that, the, that at later stages in the computation, one of the things we will need is the ability to search for a given vertex in the tree by global ID, so we had to implement that. And you can start seeing that, especially if you want to do this in full parallel, it becomes crucial to have a parallel friendly data structure like the hyperstructure to support your operations. The other thing we noticed, and um, 
we had to adapt to is that in order to be able to have reliable ID numbers for different branches of the tree, you can see we start off with a shared information, we then insert more. And what we'd been doing as a strategy is that we'd been starting at the outside of the tree and working to the inside of the tree, and the outside of the tree had the lowest ID numbers. Problem is, since different blocks will have different numbers of, of super uh, nodes in the tree, that means that we can't do it that way anymore. So we had to reverse our numbering process and number from the inside out. The benefit of that, however, was that that meant that at any level, the set of ID numbers for the parent tree was a strict prefix of the ID numbers for the subtree, and that meant that a lot of the computations became easier. Um, finally, regular nodes only need to be stored on the local blocks. So what this does is it keeps as much information as possible at the lowest level and only communicates the stuff needed to reconcile contours which cross boundaries. And those, we can compute where they belong in the tree using our existing technologies. Now, a couple of optimizations. I said we use all of the, the, the boundary uh, vertices. The truth is we don't have to. There's previous work which shows that all you really need are the critical points on the boundaries, and that saved us a fair amount of communication. So to do that, um, we modified it. And then, as I said, one of the problems is what happens if the extremum at the end of the branch isn't part of the boundary? You're then going to have to cut your super arc in, in half, and you can see that that could get messy. So instead of, which that, instead of doing the strict graph closure, we do the super structure closure, meaning we always keep the full super arc. Um, the next thing we did was we said that when we add things back in, for example, on the left, the yellow branch, Notice that the saddle it joins isn't necessarily a saddle that anybody else needs to know about. So we treat it as an attachment point, and that means at the lower levels, we're using a lazy insertion strategy so that we don't have to share that information. Um, and then we just record which super arc we're going to insert on. And again, this is all for the purpose of minimizing the communication and maximizing the distribution of the data structure. Yeah, that's all very well, but does it work? That's the obvious question. And the answer is yes. So starting off with strong scaling performance, and um, as you know, strong scaling performance is what sort of performance curve do we see when we throw more resources at it? Um, and we tested on a variety of data sets from noisy 2D, which is the G-topo, through clean 3D in the form of the Warpex, and noisy, um, uh, 3D in the form of Nix, and even noisier acquired data in the form of the microns. And what we saw fairly consistently was that we were seeing reasonably good scaling performance um, until we started dropping the block size, the size of the data on each block, um, down to the level that we weren't getting much local parallelism performance out of it at all. So um, that's why we're tending to see the scaling off. And also, if you look at the, the red line there, which is Summit, uh, where we ran some of our tests, it's starting to come back up. And we think what's happening there is that's because we have to move it out from the CPU, so out from the GPU onto the CPU in order to do the communication. Um, but the bottom line, which is in the lower right corner, is that when we go back and compare pure speed, speed up in, um, not in serial, but we compare it against the PPP, which is the shared memory um, solution. If we allocate 64 threads and maximum local parallelism and then distributed it, um, our performance gain, and it's a bit hard to read on this slide, but it is in the, the paper, our performance gain peaks at about 70 times faster. And that was on 128 nodes. So we're getting good, but not perfect, speed up by throwing more resources at it. And when you combine that with the fact that on that local SMP, we may very well be getting 20-fold speed up from the previous work, that means that our overall speed up is now over 1,000. Now, what about weak scaling? So what we did for this one is we took the Microns data set, which is actually an acquired data set, so it's very noisy data, and took 
more and more blocks of it so that we got more and more topology. And what we saw was that as the computation progressed, the fan in cost started becoming significant, and, um, but it was tolerable. And that is the strongest statement we will make. In other words, if we take one node with two ranks and then take it up to 128 nodes with 256 ranks, the actual time cost of it only went up by a factor of about three, maybe three and a half. And so that we're seeing some good but not perfect speed up, both in terms of the strong scaling and in terms of the weak scaling. Now. We then asked, well, how does it compare um, with Valerio's previous work? And at this point, it was a little bit difficult because that code is now nearly 20 years old. So um, what we did was at an earlier stage um, of our own um, process, we'd actually implemented it using our framework um, to cross-check. So these are, these are results that um, we might be able to improve later on. But what we did basically was we took the PPP implementation locally and then used Valerio and Cree's algorithm for distribution. So we gave them the full benefit of the local parallelism and ran their algorithm and compared it with an earlier version of ours. Now, on the left, which is the G-topo, which is 2D, and which is fairly noisy, you'll notice that um, as we increase the number of nodes, we are doing considerably better. And the core reason for that, as I said, is that we're keeping as much information locally as we can. Um, on the Warpex data set, which is clean, they outperformed us because the quantity tree is small. And on the Nix data set, again, we outperformed them. So the answer is for noisy data set, we are showing significant performing gains. Bonus, debugging this stuff is a nightmare. We ended up dug dumping out hundreds of graphs using GraphViz, turning them into graphs so that we could trawl through them by hand. And the net result was I got artwork for the new building we're in in Leeds. We couldn't have done this without the support from the people providing the funding and from the people providing the data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hirish, for a very nice talk. We have time for questions. If you have questions, please come up to the microphones or post online on Slido. Maybe we'll get started. Can you talk a little bit about the VTKM implementation? I think you implemented oh, all of this in VTKM. I forgot. It's already available in VTKM. Yeah, we should probably thank Ken Morland for reviewing the code. <laughs> uh, it occurred to me, I mean, we were writing that, that that was missing the acknowledgments. Uh, yes, apologies. Actually, it was on the slides. I forgot to say it. Thank you, Kenny, for, for masterminding VTKM. Um, it is already implemented in VTKM, as is stuff that we haven't had the chance to submit for publication yet. Hi, Wiebke Köpp from KTH Stockholm. Could you comment on later downstream applications and challenges that arise from having the data structure di distributed, let's say branch decomposition, simplification, and so on? That's in the next paper, which we haven't had a chance to write up yet. Um, the answer is, um, if you look at the work that um, Peter Christoph did for me, uh, which was at LDAV a couple of years ago on hypersweeps, we do know how to do it. And because the distributed hierarchical contra tree also uses the hyperstructure, it is an extension of that. There are a couple of additional twists to it which we had to master. Um, but what we're currently working on is getting it properly hooked up in C2 and delivering on application examples. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Is there one last quick question, maybe? Otherwise, we're good in time. Thank you very much, Hamish, again. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, so the next talk will be given by Florent Nolot, and it's on topological analysis of ensembles for hydrodynamic turbulent flows, an experimental study. Hello everyone, I'm Florian Nolo, a PhD student in Applied Mathematics, and I work at, um, in French National Lab, the Atomic French Energy Commissions, and also to the University at Bordeaux. And today, I will present our work on an application paper on topological analysis of ensemble of hydrodynamic turbulent flow, with that conjunct to the uh, experimental study. The main goal of this project is to develop a new simulation code in the context of fast design atmospheric reentry vehicles. To do that, we need to develop a new 3D simulation code and run some simulations like this double solid in hypersonic regimes. And when you make a simulation in hypersonic regimes, the difficulty is to compute many different physical phenomena. For example, you, for example sorry, you need to compute strong discontinuities like shock wave. We need to recoup precisely the wall data to design the object, like the pressure flux or the head flux, and also to modelize the turbulent flow represented here. And to do so, I use a sharp image boundary method with Cartesian grid to avoid the mesh generations. And um, when you make um, computation of free dynamics, we need to use two main ingredients. We need to use uh, interpolations to reconstruct variable at the faces. And after, you need to um, resolve a woman problem to compute variable in the size, like the density, the velocity, or the pressure. Um, in my work, I have implemented many different numerical methods. And one of the biggest challenges of this project is to set up the parameters of the simulations and choose the best numerical method to take into account the, um, the, cost, the cost calculations and the accuracy calculations. So now I will present you the two main ingredients. I begin with the interpolations. Based on the literature, we have chosen two interpolations. The first one is the 1 0 interpolations. This interpolation can be computed at the order 5 and 7 to gain in precisions for the um, description of the phenomena. With this interpolation, we can capture the strong discontinuities like SOC easily, but this, this reconstruction is said dissipative, and we can succeed to modelize uh, the turbulent flow enough. And it's for that, we have a second interpolation. This interpolation is a tenor interpolation. Mm, the tenor has the same advantage as the one interpolations, but it's a low dissipative reconstruction. With this type of reconstructions, we can compute and modelize the turbulent flow more easily. That is due to the stency, which is different than the one of the stencils, and also to a new ingredient, which we can separate the small, the small structure of the turbulence to the strong discontinuities. The problem of these reconstructions is that tenor is more expensive in cost of calculation than the one or z reconstructions. And now I will talk about the women solvers. If you want to resolve a women problems, you can use an exact women solvers. But this numerical method is very expensive due to the, no the larger number of nonlinear operations. It's for that, in general, in research in upper mathematics, I developed many different approximate women solvers. And in this study, we are interested in two families, the three different, the three different splitting solvers with the HLL, HLC, and WAR solvers, and the three type splitting solvers with the RSMAP plus and the SLOW2 solvers. With the first family, 
it is difficult to reconstruct the row and the high velocity in the simulations. But with the second family, you can do that. For example, if you make a simulation in hypersonic regime, sometimes you can meet a recirculation bubbles, and in the recirculation bubbles, the velocity is close to zero. And in the rest of your domain calculations, the velocity is very high. And you can create some oscillation near the recirculation bubbles. And with the second type of server, you don't have these oscillations. Um, another time, the free type splitting server, the second family, is more expensive than the first family. And for example, if you make a calculation in subsonic regime, all the velocities in your domain calculation are very low, and it's better to use the first family to compute your simulation. And now I will present to you the many implementation in the code. Um, if I want to choose one numerical method, I need to compare it. And to do that, I have selected um, Kevin Imot's instability test case. All guys in this room know this test case because when you see the sky and you have a cloud, you can see a sharing zone where your turbulence appears. This is due to the different velocity and uh, this, uh, this is due to the different density and opposite velocity. Here, I have plot for you a terrain view um, to represent the vortex center by the mountains. And the, measure, the, um, the variable used in this theory to describe the, um, the turbulent flow is the Hans trophy. The Hans trophy is locally the, the square of the flow vortex city. And this test case is very, is very funny because we have many variabilities depending on the different local method, like the Riemann solver, the interpolations, the others, but also due to the resolutions and the times. And when you have this type of turbulence, in general, in computer free dynamics, use traditional approaches based on one average quantities. Many times, it's the kinetic energy power spectrums. And if you make your average and you have a slope equal to k power minus 5 divided by 3 or k power minus 3, so we can consider it your turbulent flow uh, give an average physical solution, and it's very good. But now if you look the graph here, you can see we, can't, uh, we don't have any real difference between the different server. Just for the HL server, we can see you have a, a little difference compared to the others. And now if you look the terrain view, you can see all the vortices are not the same emplacement in, uh, in the simulations. And it's so difficult for engineers and researchers in my domain to understand and analyze all the structure of the turbulence. It's for that, engineers in my research lab give me five hypotheses, named H1 to H5. Later in my presentation, I give more details about these different hypotheses. But if I want to give a response to validate all the hypotheses, I need to use new approaches with new tools. And we decide to use the topological data analysis. Because with analysis, I can identify easily the vortex center of my simulations. If I want to work up the entropy maxima, I can use the past tense diagram. And when you compute turbulence, um, turbulence simulations, you introduce some noise or numerical error due to the method. And we can remove it all with the past tense thresholds. I use uh, an open source library, the topology toolkit library. Uh, no available like Paravu plugins. And it's developed at Sober University by one of my advisors, Julian Chani, and it's correct. And if I use this library, it's because we have many tools, like the cinema with the persistence diagram or persistence clusterings, to analyze the turbulent flow. And with these different, uh, these different tools, and we made three different protocols to analyze and compare the different mechanical methods presented before. The first protocol is to confirm the hypothesis H1 and H2. It means the Teno interpolations produce more vortices than the 1 or Z interpolations. And also, we have an independence of order between the 5 and the 7 orders when you compute the Kevin Amos instabilities. 
To set up this protocol, I need to use the extraction of critical points, the pass-tense thresholds, the pass-tense curve, and compute an integral difference between my two, between my persistence curve here represented in the go area. So now we present you an example to validate the hypothesis H2. The first step is to take two ensemble of five configuration, one for the other five, and the second for the other seven. Just the solver vary in these protocols, and the um, other parameters are fixed. After we need to extract the critical point, compute the patient's diagram and the patient's curve. Now we can you can compute the mean persistence curve for the first ensemble and for the second ensemble. I use a threshold to remove some numerical error of my simulations. And we can compute the integral difference to compare the five and the seven order. And now, if you look in the top pictures, you can see my integral difference is close to, is close to zero for the tenor interpolations. And it means the topological structure of the turbulence for the Kevin modes are very closed. But now, if you look the result for the 1OZ interpolations, um, the integral difference is larger than zero. And if you look the two pictures, the two figures, you can see the number of large vertices or small vertices are very different between the five order and the seven order. And this result is very, is very interesting because one of the paper, uh, White Bison and all, saying we have an independence of order for, the, for this interpolation, for the one of the interpolations, when you make a traditional approaches. And it's normal because if you make an average in your domain of one quantities, you can distinguish the contribution of the small vertices masked by the weight of the larger vertices. And now we present you the second protocol. With this protocol, I want to show you the HL server is very different to the other servers. I need to use the extraction of critical points and also the distance matrices. First, we take 20 configurations where the time and the resolution are fixed. We compute the persistence diagram and we regroup all these diagram in the unique data set to compute the distance matrices. In this study, we use two different metrics, the ventilation distance directly on the persistence diagram and the L2 norm with the on-surface carrier field. Each line of this matrix represents the distance of one configuration to the others, and the black frame is the representation of the 20 cache in the left. After that, I sum each line of the distance matrix to obtain the global distance per solvers. We make this study nine times for all the time step and all the resolutions. And to finish, we compute the percentage difference between uh, all the solver on the nine distance matrices. And if you look at the result for the Wunderstein distance and for the ultra norm, we have approximately 20% of difference between the HL solver and the other solvers. And if you remember, with the traditional approaches, we can see some little difference between the HL server and the other servers. This is due to, this is due to one characteristic of the HL server. This server cannot, uh, cannot take into an account the contact discontinuities and the interface between vertices are less defined that to conduct to produce less vertices in your simulation results. And now the last protocols to confirm the hypothesis H4 and H5. This hypothesis means the HLC solver and the worst solver are very close when you make a simulation of the Kevin Nimots, and the slow 2 solver and USM plus solver are very close also. I need to use the extraction of critical point, the distance matrix, the clustering method, and another matrix, the rounding index, explained uh, later in my presentation. I will present you an example for T1 and T2. First, we take five configurations, use your solver value in this study. We extract the critical points and compute the percentage diagram. This time, we use two thresholds, one for remove the numerical errors, 
and one for remove the large structure of the turbulence. The first step is to compute the distance matrices. After that, we can apply demotion reductions um, to project the distance matrices according to components. Now I can use a Kamins algorithm to generate a cluster. And I request three clusters because I need to compare my cluster with a reference cluster. And my reference cluster is composed to, to, uh, by three clusters. One with the uh, HLC and WAR solvers, uh, another with the SLO2 and IOSM plus solvers, and the last with the HLC solver. So, to compare my different cluster generated with my reference cluster, I need to, uh, I need to compute a similarity variables. And we choose the one index. The, this variable, have a value between 0 and 1, where 0 indicating there are no similarity between my reference clusters and my cluster generated by the Cummins algorithms, and 1 indicating we are exactly the same cluster between my reference cluster and my candidate clusters. And now the results. We make this study for three different clustering methods. We apply the um, protocol explained previously for the Altu norm and von Sachten distance. And the last method is developed by Vidan R, noted W star, W2 star. And this method used just the distance diagram without use the distance matrices. And now if you use the result, you can see the last clustering method have a result closer to one. It means with this method, you can see more similarity between the different family of solvers. And also, I've made this study for the first order work constructions and the high order work constructions. With the, with the precision of calculation of the high order work constructions, it's more difficult to see the difference between the solvers. And it's, it's, uh, and it's also for that, for the first order, we are closer to one. And with this protocol, I said also to validate my hypothesis four and five. So, to conclude, with the 180 simulation configurations available at this address, and also to my three different protocols, I succeed to validate the hypothesis. This study um, are also a good indicator for in general, in open mathematics like me, to choose the numerical method or set up your parameter simulations. And we succeed also to prove the topological method can be used to describe and analyze and compare, and compare the turbulent flow. In my future work, I want to extend this three different protocol to the 3D simulations, like the double episode presented before, and also to test new topological tools like some topological distances or clustering method with the same data and the same protocols. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. We have time for questions. If you have questions, please come up to the microphones or post on Slido. Okay, so maybe to get started, I wanted to ask in the in the last protocol, I think you did some thresholding on, on the large vortices. Can you can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. If you when you make um, a fluid computations. It's easy to compute the larger vertices because these vertices is defined in many cells. And it's more difficult to just, to just compute a small vertices because these vertices is defined in few cells, sometimes one or two. And the difficulty is to compute the low velocity inside the vertices and the high velocity near the vertices. And if you want to compare my different women solver, it's better to analyze just the small structure of the turbulence. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have a question? 
Okay. Can, can you talk about the general 3D case, maybe? Well, it's like com completely 3D data, like, 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 like a bigger, bigger volumes? Uh, bigger volumes? Um, uh, so what, what was the size, like in, in, in 3D? Can you have uh, a few data? Yes. Simulation. Um, I have one example for 3D simulations. For example, the, um, uh, the te Taylor Green Vortex. And to analyze these simulations, it's very difficult because you need to use many processors. For example, to produce the, the spectrums, um, I need to use maybe 32 processors, and it's the same to analyze the to analyze this type of the 3D simulations because uh, meshes is very expensive when you make 3D computations. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, if not, then thanks, uh, Florent, very much again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. So the next talk will be given by Keita Watanabe. He will talk about angular-based edge bundled parallel coordinates plot for the visual analysis of large ensemble simulation data. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Keita Watanabe from Conway University. This is the title. These are another collaborator, collaborators for this work. In recent years, severe is a disaster such as terrible rains have been increasing in frequency and intensity. This can originate fruits and radius causing human and economic damage. Weather simulation using high performance permitting systems such as shown is here, here HPC, has received increasing attention for such a disaster prevention pre and mitigation. Ensemble simulation has been used for such as weather simulations, where multiple simulations with different initial conditions are skills, and each simulation is called ensemble member. The ensemble member simulation result can be described as a, a set of traditional time varying much variate volumetric data, uh, proportionally to the number of members. This orange line is uh, each ensemble member, and this blue line is ensemble mean. Uh, operational with a simulations have normally used tens members. However, larger simulation with hundred, hundreds of members has been used for research purpose. And in this work, we use a 100 member simulation result. We can also mention that high resolution simulation have become common, and in this work, we use a simulation with 30 second time resolution and 500 meter horizontal resolution. Domain expert in metrology Meteorology and uh, have historically used mean and variance for analyzing ens ensemble simulation outputs. However, it is difficult to assess the behavior among the members or in comparison to the ground truth data. It may also require analysis from the different fa facets such as members, variables, space, and time. In this work, we focus on parallel coordinate plots, or PCP, which is popular visualization technique for analyzing, analyzing high-dimensional data sets. Correlation, correlation between adjusting variables can be inferred from the intersection pattern of line segments, and it can also cover two facets simulation initially. In this work, we focus on members and variables. 
However, when applying PCP onto large ensemble simulation data, it may suffer from the visual cluttering due to the overplotting with the increasing of polyline or members. There are already some existing approaches for minimizing this problem, such as those shown here. And our work was inspired in this second approach. To address this problem, we propose Angular Best Edge Puzzle Continuity Plot, PAPCP. It is used average line segment deals the number of plot protopoly line and scatter plot from Angular distribution plot are added to provide the correlation information between the adjusting product axis. In the next slide, we will explain each of these steps to generate the APCP. The ensemble data treated in this work consists of a set of members. Each member has a special information related to the grid points of a simulation treated here as fields. A set of variables is assigned to each of grid points and for each the time steps. To facilitate the implementation, this ensemble data based on member M, field F, time T, variable B, is expressed as a fourth order tensor data. To obtain the PCP of each member, we first slice the member at the user defined time step T. Then the PCP generated by setting each of variables as a power axis and each grid point as point line. The operation performed the old member of generating the set of PCPs. Comparison analysis of these PCPs via superposition can be affected by visual cutting due to the overplotting. To minima minimize the, this overplotting problem, we opted to use average line segment by using the mean for each variable's or axis. As shown is in this figure, the PCP each member will be represented as a single polyline in the PCP with average line. In this problem of simplified PCP is a correlation information among the adjusting, adjusting axis will be lost. To solve this problem, we propose the use of the angular distribution plot, ADP, to express intersection pattern and angular information of lines between axes. As shown here, the commonly possible to visually infer the correlations between adjusting variables in PCP by analyzing the intersection patterns of the line segment. For instance, positive correlation. Positive correlation can be inferred when the, there is no intersection between the axes. Negative correlation when there are many line segment intersection on the center region of the just adjacent axis. And we can infer that there is no correlation when the line segment in, intersect in a random manner without a certain pattern. We use the angle information of line segment between adjacent variable axis to obtain the mean and variance. And the result is plotted in, the, in this graph named angular distribution plot, ADP. This figure shows the duration shapes between the intersection pattern and the corresponding, corresponding plotting regions. The horizontal axis represents the mean of angles. And the mean value is zero is plotted at the center. The indicated the slope or tendency of the line segment. That is small. Mean value indicates that many lines, line segments have a negative slope. And on the other hand, large mean value indicates that many line segments have positive slope. The vertical line axis represents the variance distribution. And the various value zero is plotted at the bottom of the vertical axis. This indicated correlation between the variables 
and the smaller variance, the less intersection between line segment, thus more positive will be decoration. On the other hand, larger the variance, the more the intersection between the line segment near the central region, thus more negative will be decoration. As a result, the angular, angular distribution plot in a, is a set of scatter plots generated at each pair of variables and for each of the members. The angular-based edge bundled PCP is obtained by combining the BC PCP with average line segment and the scatter plots from the angular distribution plot. As shown in this figure, we've used a basic cubic basic curve to connect the average line segment, line segment with its corresponding scatter plots. As some analysis example, a negative correlation can be inferred in this region. Because of the large variance, on the other hand, positive correlation can be inferred in this region because of small variance. In addition, in this region, the negative slope can be inferred because of the negative mean value. On the other hand, positive slope can be inferred in this region because of the positive mean value. We implemented the vision analytics, analytics prototype system for evaluating the proposed APCP approach. We use the CPPR language and the QTSX framework. In addition, in addition to the Kyoto Visualization System, KVS, a visualization application deployment platform. Additional views to the APCP and ADP were implemented in the form of coordinating the views. We added the winning value coordinate plot, BPCP view, and cross tension plot, CSP view. To assist the visual analytics of ensemble simulation data. In the BCP view, all variables for the select of members, select member of interact, interest will be displayed. Bins with larger data will be displayed on the top. The CSP view shows a spatial distribution of the user selected variable. For the ex experimental Evolution, we use the metallurgical ensemble simulation with 100 members of a torrential rainfall occurred at the Kobe University September 11, 2014. This simulation was run on the Fugaku supercomputer simulated at the same place, Kobe University, Kobe City. Uh, the number of grid points is 160 times, 106 times, 48 with 100 meter horizontal resolution. This simulation uses 100 meters, 11 variables, and 30 time steps. In the case studies, we use one time step selected by the domain expert. This demo video shows an example of interactive visual visual explain for the selected time step. On the APCP view and ADP view, users are able to interactively select a member and variable of interest. In the BPCP view, all variable for the selected member of interest will be displayed. The BPCP allows the user to select the variable of interest. They can also interactively change the drawing range. The CSP view shows the spatial distribution of user selected variable. User can also interactively navigate through the cross associational views by the slider. We conduct two case studies with a domain, ex domain expert who carried out a methodological ensemble simulation. Case one. Focus on the two variables, the cloud water, QC, which is strongly connected with the precipitation procedure and the vertical window, 
plus D, W, which, which contributes to accelerate the trans, trans, translation of, the, of cloud vapor to cloud water. That is, that is, this is relationship indicates the potential for the occurrence of the heavy rainfall. From, a, from the ADP, we can verify that all members as small variance and negative, negative means. That is, we can be inferred that all members have positive correlation and tendency to a negative slope. The domain, domain expert inform that the positive corre, correlation can be explained with, when the convention, convention, convection is in the development stage and the, and the fact of all sector plot accumulated in this region means that all members and all members are contributing to active the conviction. In addition, the fact of true state being the smallest value, smallest value, no contradiction with the observational data. We can observe three groups in APCP. Group with large mean, small mean, and value in the middle. So we conduct further analysis. We focus three member at each member, each of the groups, member 66, member one, and two state. By the zooming, zooming, the ADP axis, we can verify that angular variance of member 66 is larger than other two members. As a result, we can infer that member 66 has more line segment intersection between axis than the, the other two. To confirm the observation, we use the BPCP and the blasting. As shown here, we can confirm that, that member 66 has more line crossing than the other two members in the BPCP view. By changing the draw range of the, of the W axis by blasting, we can observe that there are only few intersection between the axis, confirming the positive correlation. In addition, we can also confirm the decreasing trend. We also use the cross-tensional cross plot, CSP view, to confirm the positive correlation and decreasing tendency. So I said the altitude around 1,000 meters were selected by the domain expert informing that this attitude gives important informants information about this deployment of convection. The positive correlation can be confirmed due to similar, similar spatial distribution and the decreasing trend from the background color, which is changes from color depending larger to larger to smaller value, that is green to purple. The second case is between barium PT and W, which are also associated with severe rainfall. On both APCP and ADP, we can observe the two separate groups. Groups of all members and the two states. In addition, from the ADP, we can infer that the true state have negative slope. As in the case one, we use the BPCP that confirm this. That is the negative slope. For the, this purpose, we select the member one from the group of all members. As shown here from the BPCP, we can confirm that true state has stronger negative slope than member one. In the same manner, you, you, we use a CSP for analyzing this negative slope trend. In addition to the 1,000 meter altitude, the domain experts select slides uh, that higher altitude. 
at the to around the 5,500 meters, we can clearly confirm the decreasing trend from PT to W in the true state by observing the desired background color. We also conducted a high hypothesis analysis to confirm the suspicion of the influence of the QZ during, during the analysis just on 2017, but was not possible to confirm at the time. By using the visual analytic system, we could verify that all members overestimate the QZ value in com comparison the, to the true state. During the simulation process, it is selected that generated ex excessive ice particles that accessibility cools the upper sky, thus lowering, just lowering variable of PT, and we can observe the fact on the PC ax PT axis, where all members have no lower PT values that the true state. As the value of PT becomes smaller, the upper sky becomes the unstable atmosphere. And as a result, but the value of PT and ensemble focus becomes smaller than the true state. Thrice, since the upper sky becomes unstable atmosphere, a large value of W predict predicted in ensemble forecast. And we can observe that, that fact on the W axis where all members have higher W values that of the true state. Our proposal for Angular based, by, based edge boundary PCP simplifies PCP of each member into a single <coughs> differencing curve line. We improve implemented the visual analytics plot time system with additional condition con coordinate link views. From the evaluation result using 100 meters ensemble weather simulation result, we confirm that it can eff efficiently minim minimize the visual cutting problem due to the over plotting. plotting. While maintaining maintain the correlation information between the adjusting parallel axis. This approach is useful to overview the relationship among members and variables, and to analysis, analyze the members and variables with characteristic behavior. As some future works, we will try to take, a, take into consideration the ordering the parallel coordinate axis, and we will also try to improve the BPCP view to facilitate the understanding of data distribution, we are also thinking to make possible the use of other facets such as time during interactive visual analytics. At the end, we would like to thank you, funding agency, for and for the combination resource to run this simulation. Thank you for very, thank you for very much for attention. Thank you very much, Kita, for the very nice talk. We have time for questions. If you have questions, please come up to the microphones. So maybe to get started, can you can you say why you chose PCA curves? Can can you say why you chose PCA curves? Oh, uh this BPCP and this uh, data distribution is not clear. So um, uh, fusion the histogram or violin plot. The, the more clearly the data distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because well, you have chosen other curves or straight lines or is, is there a specific reason for PCA curves? Could, could you have chosen other curve types, or what, is there a specific reason why you use PCA curves? Sorry. 
So you could also do straight lines or, or do the curves make it easier visible? Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, there's another question. Michael? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Michael Böttinger, German Climate Computing Center. Um, it, it, it's maybe more, more a, a remark than a, a question because um, I think it's easier to understand um, the analysis, analysis of the data if you explain what means QS, Q, V, or uh, uh, the other variables, maybe in an interactive version with a mouse over or something, because uh, they have a physical meaning. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that W, for example, is a vertical wind, which maybe beside of four people or so, nobody knows in this room. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and and the ver vertical w wind is then uh, connected. It, it's up up welling of uh, humid air, for example, uh, uh, connected with strong rain. And then uh, I think the the case you were making with the data set would be much more convincing. So may I ask? Ah, uh, may I try to answer this guy? Thank you very much for this uh, information. Uh, actually. Our colleague that actually did the simulation uh, sent us this uh, table with the uh, explanation. explanation about uh, each variable. And we forgot to put in the slide. Yeah. I know this is uh, missing information. OK, thank you. Other, other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, let's thank Keita very much again. Very nice work. Thank you. And this concludes the session. So let's thank all the speakers of the session again. Thank you very much for attending. And the next session will start at 3.45.